Hey, what's up guys? Welcome to the 360 video production course. My name is Noah and I'm here to show you everything you need to know about filming 360 video with GoPro cameras. All right, so I went out when I first started learning how to produce 360 video and I bought a bunch of GoPro cameras and a seven camera rig and I made a lot of mistakes, uh, screwed up some footage and I didn't know exactly what I was doing. So I wanna save you that embarrassment and that struggle of trying to figure all this stuff out on your own. So I'm producing this course to walk you through A to Z, how to get out and get some equipment, all the stuff that you're gonna to need to film properly, as well as some best practices to save you that time and energy of doing things wrong the first time. So what we're gonna go over in this course is, yeah, like the equipment, we're gonna go over best practices for filming, and we're also gonna dive into some great tips and strategies for uh, consistent workflow in post-production, including the stitching, as well as color correction, and many other fun things are gonna be tough to figure out on your own. So, with that in mind, buckle your seatbelts and get ready to go. All right, guys, welcome back. We're about to dive in and go over all the equipment that you're gonna need to film some fantastic 360 video. First item is our GoPro rig. Uh, this is a seven camera GoPro rig from 360 Heroes. It's 3D printed practically indestructible, um, lightweight, easy to, fun, easy to use, um, and pretty self-explanatory. You also wanna make sure that you have a set of GoPros. Um, if you look closely, you'll see that I have eight GoPros, even though I have a seven camera rig. You always wanna make sure you have extra just in case something happens and you show up on set and one of your cameras is either overheated or is out of battery, SD card's not working. It's always good to have a backup. Now, keep in mind, for your rig, there are a lot of options out there. There's six camera, eight camera, 10 camera. You can get some great six camera rigs from GoPro's Omni. You can use Freedom 360, they make some great ones. There's also a lot of indie companies that are doing some great 360 uh, printing as well. So feel free, go out there, find one that you like, um, that speaks to you, and you're gonna achieve some, practically the same results with most of this, with most of this stuff. Uh, the differences are subtle, but the same workflow should apply. Now, moving on, you wanna make sure that you have enough batteries to get out there and be fearless when you're shooting. General rule of thumb, when I'm going out to film, I always wanna make sure that I have at least three rounds of batteries, that way in case something goes wrong or I roll a little longer than, than I anticipated, I've got enough batteries so that um, I can get through the day without having to miss a shot. You'll also need some good SD cards. These are the micro SD cards that are perfect for the GoPro. These are a little small, so we'll have to kind of zoom in over here. But um, make sure that you get the SD cards that are recommended by GoPro. You wanna make sure that they have the, the right writing speed and they're gonna be fast enough, strong enough to hold all of that data. The other thing that's important to know about these SD cards is you don't necessarily need to get 128 gigs. That's a lot of data going into a small card like that and you're asking for, for things to malfunction or to, to go bad. They're also very expensive the higher in the data they go. You should be fine with a 32 gigabyte if you know that you're gonna need more footage. Maybe you can go up to the 64, 32 is usually enough and then I have a backup in case that I do go over. Um, you also want to get some great card readers, micro SD card readers that you can plug in and um, retrieve your footage with. Finally, um, I like to have a good carrying case for my cards, making sure that everything stays nice and organized and I don't misplace any cards or I don't, I don't, I don't uh, lose the footage. Um, you also have a remote for the GoPros. If you buy your, your GoPros in bulk, generally they're gonna come in and, and provide one of these remotes for you in a kit. Um, we'll go over how to set that up in a later chapter. And you'll also wanna make sure you have a lens wipe with you because the last thing you wanna do is have one of your cameras have a smudge on it because then it's not gonna uh, match with the other cameras. Believe me, I've made that mistake. Um, you also wanna have a good trusty tripod. They, this is my, my favorite thing. It's just an old beat up thing. I'm fearless when I take this out because I know I can beat it up and it's gonna hold uh, the punches. Um, you can also use one of those monopods that has that little chicken foot apparatus at the bottom. Like, and it's, it's uh, a footrest type thing. Additionally, you wanna make sure you have a great hard case to carry all of your equipment. Finally, you wanna make sure you have some fantastic audio recording equipment. 
You can't put a boom operator in your 360 environment unless it's written in. So the recommended way to go is to use a lavalier microphone. Um, I've, I'm using the Sennheiser mics. They're nice, affordable, and reliable, as well as a Roland R44 for my recording um, device. So that's it as far as the equipment goes. It can be a little intimidating. There's a lot to cover, but once you get your hands wrapped around it, uh, you'll be out there filming some fantastic 360 video in no time. All right, so next up, we're gonna go over all of the camera settings for the GoPros, as well as how to get out and prepare everything for your shoot. All right, so let's go over some of the ins and outs of using your GoPros and getting the right camera settings for filming 360 video. First thing, um, if you haven't used GoPros before, there's a lot of just intricate settings. Um, navigating the menu takes a little bit of getting used to. You get, you get familiar with all the beeps and clicks after a little bit. Of, after a little bit. Um, definitely suggest picking up a little manual and learning what all the little symbols mean and what, uh, what all the different modes are. We're primarily only concerned with video mode. Um, you can change your mode by the thing that says mode on the front. So you click mode, toggle through until you find your video icon. Um, and then what we're gonna be changing are the settings of that video mode. On the side of the GoPro, you have a little black button with a wrench. If you click that, it'll pop up with a bunch of different uh, settings and, and filters. We're gonna toggle through, and first thing you're gonna see is the size of your resolution. If you use your mode, your silver button on the front, that'll toggle through. We're gonna go and select, uh, we want 2.7K and a 4.3 aspect ratio. The 4.3 aspect ratio is gonna get us a nice big, almost like a square. That allows us a lot of wraparound and a lot of pixel matching. If you just do regular 2.7K, that's gonna be like a 16.9 or a 16.9 aspect ratio, more like a rectangle, and it's not gonna stitch. You wanna make sure that you're in 2.7K, 4.3. Um, now let's toggle down frames per second. We're limited to being at a 30 frames per second with the, with the GoPros now. Um, maybe down the road they'll have higher frames per second, but for now we're limited to 30 frames per second. Next up is your FOV. We're gonna keep that on W for wide. Uh, the low light, it also not available. Don't worry about that. Spot meter, I usually just have that off. Pro Tunes, this is important. You wanna make sure Pro Tune is on. What that allows you to do is customize the settings for your GoPro. Um, some things that we wanna make sure is that all of our cameras are on the same settings because if one camera is off, it, it's gonna really be noticeable in that stitch. You're gonna have some hard lines and it's not gonna have that, that smooth universal feel as if it was shot from one camera. Um, so turn Pro Tunes on or Pro Tune on. Um, for our white balance. Now this is very important. Um, GoPro has four standard settings. You have 5500 for daylight, you have 3300 for like an indoors tungsten light, and then you have 6500 for like, I guess that's like under blue moonlight or something. Um, they also have the thing that they call native. I like using native just because it's gonna get you something that you can use uh, in, all, in all conditions and uh, require some minimal adjusting. So you can use that indoors, you can use that outdoors. Um, works pretty good. So we're gonna go back to our color, white balance, um, and we're gonna change that to native. So native on our white balance. Next, uh, this is another thing that's important. Make sure that your color is set to flat. This allows you the maximum adjustment in your color correction, and you're gonna be able to have some footage that doesn't always look like the GoPro. Um, trying to adjust your saturation after you shoot in the GoPro settings can be a little challenging. I personally just feel that using the flat setting uh, makes, uh, will allow you more freedom and flexibility in, in setting the tone to what you want it to be. Um, so you choose flat. The other option is GoPro. Easy there. Um, next is your ISO. Um, here, as much as possible, shoot in your lowest ISO, your 400. If it's too dark for 400 ISO, you can bump up to 1600, but you are gonna get some grain and some noise. There's another option to shoot at 64,000 or 6,400. Uh, unless you're shooting in the dark, you probably don't need to shoot that with that high ISO. You're gonna get a lot of grain, a lot of noise, and it's gonna feel really weird if you're, if you're watching it in, um, in the headset or something like that. So 
Uh, personally, 400 ISO is going to be great for outdoors. It's going to be great for a well-lit indoor environment. If you're in a darker uh, indoor environment, you can bump up to 1600. Just make sure that all of your cameras have the same ISO setting. Now, for our sharpness, um, same thing with the color profile. It's going to be easier for you to adjust the sharpness if you set it to low. Um, you can set it at whatever you like. If you just if you prefer not to have any any post workflow in adjusting your sharpness, you can shoot high. Again, I just like to shoot low sharpness because that allows me more room and more flexibility in the post process. And that is it. We're gonna go ahead and hit exit. Boom. Um, final check, we're gonna go through and just double check, make sure all of our settings are exactly the same. So we're gonna go in and we're gonna set our resolution to 2.7K with a 4.3 aspect ratio. Frames per second is at 30. Um, FOV, field of view is wide. And low light is not on, spot meter is off. Protunes is on. We have a native white balance, flat color profile, and ISO 400 with low sharpness. Then we're going to go through each one of our cameras and repeat the process. It does get a little daunting if you have to do it every time and you're, and you're moving around different environments, uh, changing these out, um, toggling through all the menus. But trust me, it's worth it to triple check instead of coming back with some footage that's not when you have one of your cameras that's off. Um, always be on the air on the side of being safe and making sure that your settings are all exactly the same it's gonna save you a lot of time and hassle in the end. Um, another thing to double check, we do have a preview screen on the camera so you can go through and double check to make sure that you have the right settings. It'll have a little preview, 2.7K, 4.3, 30 frames per second, ProTunes. Also wanna see that you have your video mode on. If you don't have your video mode on and it's on picture, you might think you're recording, but you get one picture and you know, one of your cameras doesn't have the video for the, for the rest of the, the take. Fine if it's on your tripod, but if you're on your main actor and, and you didn't roll that footage, you're a little bit SOL. So, cool. That's about it for the GoPro settings. Um, we'll go and dive into some other preparation for the shoot next. All right, so let's get started setting up our GoPro remote. We'll be able to push record once when we're done with this, and all of our seven cameras will record at the same time. You can also toggle through different modes so you can shoot uh, seven photos at the same time, or you can do seven videos at the same time. First thing you want to do is fire up all of your remote and your camera. If you hold the power button here on your remote, it should fire up. There we go. Um, and same thing with your cameras. We're going to fire all seven cameras up. Bear with me here. So now that we've got our cameras and our remote control all powered up, uh, it's time to activate our Wi-Fi. To the side of the GoPro camera, that little black wrench tool that you can use to toggle through your video settings, um, we're going to hold that down this time. We're going to keep holding it until you get a little blue button or a little blue light that, that flashes on. That's going to say that your Wi-Fi mode is on now. The first time you do that, you will have an option to toggle through and, and pair with your GoPro app or pair with the GoPro remote. You want to toggle through and select GoPro remote. That will activate another button that says um, activate pair mode on your remote. So if you go back to your remote here, and if you want to get to pairing mode, you're going to need to hold down this wrench until pair mode activates. Um, you'll see a, a similar symbol on both of these. I like to kind of hold them together. You don't have to. I think you just have to have them in rage. Once you have them all synced together, it's going to say, boom, one camera found, right? Uh, then we're going to go ahead and turn the Wi-Fi on to the next camera. Same principle, get that powered up. Uh, blue light lights on, toggle through, pair to GoPro uh, remote. The remote is in pairing mode still, so that should activate no problem. Um, we go through each one of our cameras, get the Wi-Fi turned on. And once all of that is said and done, you'll have seven cameras that have that blue light flashing, and you know they're all on Wi-Fi, and they're all synced to the remote. Okay, so now I've got, I've got all seven cameras um, flashing with the blue light. They're all paired with the remote, and I want to go ahead and do a test record. So I'm gonna hit the record button on the remote. 
But now I've got seven cameras. They're all flashing red and blue now because the Wi-Fi is on and they're recording. I want to go ahead and stop it. I just, boom, do that and they all turn off. I mean, it just feels so fun to be able to turn seven cameras on with one button. It's great. All right, so that's everything you need to know to get your remote control paired up with your GoPro cameras. Just to recap here real quick, you're going to first power on your remote, power on your GoPros. Second, you're going to activate your uh, Wi-Fi, holding down this black wrench key. Then you're going to toggle through until it says pair with GoPro remote. You're going to activate the pairing mode on your remote by holding down the wrench until you get a pairing icon. Uh, then once the two are paired, you can move on to your next camera. Get all seven cameras loaded up and then push record. It'll tell you on your remote control how many cameras are synced. Here it says seven cameras, ready. All right, so that's it for working with the remote. Next up, we're gonna go into setting up and preparing for your shoot. All right, so now that we have our cameras all synced to the same settings and we have them paired with our remote, it's time to load them into our rig and start filming. So we're gonna go ahead and remove the uh, lens cases. Uh, if you don't have lens cases, I definitely do recommend grabbing some. They're, they're very inexpensive and it's just gonna save your lenses. These are your money makers here, so keep them safe. All right, on your rig, depending on the rig that you have, um, some of these are a little more challenging than others to get in. If you're using the 360 Heroes 7 camera rig, I know that camera two is a little bit challenging to slip in. Um, I usually save that one for the, for the first. So I'll grab camera two and do that first. Now you do not have to go ahead and put them uh, in the slot that corresponds to the number. It, it might make your job a little bit easier if you have a consistent uh, direction on each, on each shot. But by all means, it, if you mix them up, it's not the end of the world. So normally I don't, I don't really pay that much attention to it, but just for the sake of this tutorial, I'm gonna go ahead and try my best to put them all in the spot that they belong in. All right, so as we load in our thing, you can just go in and snap and it locks it into place. It might feel like you're gonna break this thing. Don't worry about it. It's pretty tough. It can handle it. Um, just you know, try your best to be gentle and be careful with the side of the GoPro here. It is a little bit, uh, uh, that particular section right there is just a kind of a plastic casing. It will come off, um, be careful there. And so we will go ahead and get all of our cameras locked in. And number seven. Number seven I keep on the bottom there. Uh, Boom, makes it easy. Now we have several options. If you look at this rig, we have several choices to put our uh, uh, tripod. We can either put it on the bottom here so that our five main cameras are lined up parallel to the ground, or we can put them on a kind of a diagonal axis, kind of like some kind of uh, TIE fighter going in here. Um, now on that diagonal axis, either or, you're gonna get some great results. There's no right or wrong way here. It's just a matter of if you put this on the diagonal axis, you have three cameras that are looking at the floor. That means you have to remove your tripod if you do want to remove your tripod from three lenses, as opposed to if you put point straight down, you only have to remove your tripod from one lens. Um, other things to note, if you have your configuration where your lenses are parallel to the floor and you have actors crossing through the seams, it's a little bit easier because you only have them crossing between two lenses rather than crossing between three lenses if your thing is uh, on a diagonal configuration. Now, being on the diagonal configuration is great for landscapes. It's great for being indoors with a lot of actors that are not crossing steams. You can really have a lot of freedom and flexibility to move things and scale. Working in the parallel to the floor does have its own advantages. Again, there's no right or wrong way. Get in there, play around, see what you like the best, and uh, whatever that is, you know, go ahead and go with it. Um, next thing we're gonna do, so we're gonna go ahead and screw it to the tripod. If you're gonna do the, the top, top route, you may have to get, depending on your rig, you may have to get a, a specific, I had to get a smaller uh, screw from the hardware store. I think it was $3 to just get an extender there. Um, but for the purpose of this tutorial, we're going to go ahead and put this on a diagonal, diagonal axis with the provided screw. 
So first thing I'm gonna do after I get this loaded up is pull out a lens wipe and wipe down my lenses because I just got my grubby paws all over them and uh, the lenses are now caked in grease. All right, so now that we have our lenses all cleaned up, our cameras are loaded into our rig, it's time to start shooting. Yeah. All right, so now, let's, now we've got all our camera settings figured out. We've got all our ca seven cameras are all set to the same settings. Um, we are ready to go start recording some test footage. So we're out at our building's parking garage and we're gonna record a test set of us playing some street hockey. Yes. All right, so the very first thing we're gonna do is we're gonna wipe down all of our lenses because I've been moving them around, setting up the camera. So we're gonna quickly go through, make sure there's no smudge, there's no dirt, there's no grime, there's no grease, and everything is, is fantastic. Now it's time to think about the height of our camera. Uh, traditional filming, you wanna have your, your camera kind of at the same level with your subject's head. In 360 filming, because we're working with such wide angles, I've found that it works much better to have your camera about chest level of your subjects. Um, especially if your subjects are about at least six feet away, what that happened, what that does is it allows you to have a little more room in um, with the horizon. Everything just looks a little more natural. Next, uh, we're going to have to think about how far away our subjects are going to be from the lens. Now, this is actually one of the most important problems we, we're going to face in stitching. When we're working with stitching, we've got to factor in that these two points are going to converge at some point on the horizon. The last thing to take into consideration is where your lenses are and where the section in between your lenses is. This section between your lenses, that is where the seam is going to be when you're stitching. Um, it's going to be very challenging if you have somebody there positioned and moving around uh, to have a consistent, well-stitched seam. If you have your actors and performers doing their actions in between the lenses, chances are you're going to have a little bit of a trouble when you're trying to stitch them all together. All right, so hope you guys are ready to record our test footage that we're gonna to use to stitch. Um, this is gonna be our demo scene that we're gonna produce. I've got my trusty interns here with us and we're about to record. First thing we're gonna do is fire up the camera. We're gonna go ahead and hold down the power button on your remote control and these will start powering up. First thing we wanna check when these power up is to make sure that we have all cameras ready. Uh, as we look at the remote, we start seeing when the cameras are there and they're connected to the Wi-Fi, I've, right now I've got one camera loaded. If they're not connected, what you can do is you can just kind of reset the Wi-Fi on that, turn it back, turn it off and turn it back on. It should, it should link. Now I have six cameras and that's seven cams. Okay, so now I've got all seven cameras are showing up on the remote so we can start recording our scene. I'm gonna go ahead and hit record now and just to double check and confirm that all of the cameras are rolling and then we're gonna go ahead and break out into our positions and record our scene. So you guys ready? Yeah. All right, let's do it. So push record on the remote control. Um, going around the cameras, one, two, three, four, five, six, and seven. All of my cameras are recording and we're ready to do this. So let's go. They've got to score a goal on me. Uh oh, uh oh, oh no! <laughs> All right, so now that we've finished our successful test shoot, it's time to upload our footage to our computer and also disassemble our GoPro rig. So how do we do that? Well, it's easy. Let's go ahead and start taking our cameras out of the rig. We're gonna start, <clears throat> start with camera seven. You know, I like to have a system so that way I know uh, where my footage is going every time. It doesn't really matter what, uh, what order your footage goes in, as long as you, you only have one of each camera um, going to the stitch program. I like to have them organized just so I can wrap my head around everything a little easier. First thing we're gonna do, we're gonna go ahead and take the SD card out. Um, there's a little black protective cover. Hang on to that, you don't wanna lose that. Um, go ahead and push down 
pull out your micro SD card. And there's a couple ways that you can you can take your micro SD cards and read them. I have these kind of straight to USB um, readers, which I personally like. You can also kind of use uh, to a, a regular SD converter. You just you would just slide that in and put that into your SD card reader. Um, since we're going to be doing ours with the USB ones, we're going to go ahead and drop our SD cards in. I'm going to go ahead and do all of this step at once. So I'm going to remove all seven micro SD cards and line them up. So I start with camera seven. Also going to remove, uh, put the protective cover back so I don't lose it. And <clears throat> I'm going to remove the battery and get that to a charge. I know all of my batteries were basically um, ran out because I left the Wi-Fi on overnight and uh, it drained the battery. So I'm removing the battery, setting that to a charge. I use these little uh, multi chargers so I can charge a few at the same time, get those ready to go. Um, and I'm going to set my GoPros off to the side and I'm just going to move down to the down in the row. So I'm going to grab camera six and depending on your rig, these can be a little tricky to pull out, but uh, you know, generally once you get the hang of it, it's they're pretty fun. So, all right, first thing we're going to do, grab the S micro SD card out. It's great if you have fingernails, it makes it a little easier. Um, hang on to your protective case, throw your micro SD card in your micro SD card reader and set that to the side. Put your protective case back and remove your battery and put it to charge. Uh, set your GoPro off to the side. And we're gonna go ahead and just repeat that process for the rest of the GoPros. Okay, so now that we've got our micro SD cards removed from all of our cameras and we have them ready to input into the computer, uh, we've also got our batteries removed and ready to charge. All right, so let's move on to uploading to your computer and logging your files. Okay, so when we come back from our shoot and we start loading up all of our footage, we want to put each SD card in its own folder. So we're gonna create seven folders and we're gonna put all of our footage within those seven folders. So what we'll have is something that looks like this. Each folder has the footage from that camera um, organized there. We did two takes, so we have scene one and scene two, and you'll see each camera has the footage from that card. We're gonna go ahead and rename each one of these corresponding to the scene number and the camera number. If it's in folder one, it's gonna be camera one. And we had two scenes, so it's we're gonna write S1 and S2, C1 and C1. We're gonna move on to camera two and we're gonna repeat the process. We're gonna have scene one, camera two. Scene two, this is, this is a challenge here. So this is camera two, scene two, camera two, not three, two, there we go. So it, it gets challenging to just kind of wrap your head around it, but by the time you'll get to the seventh camera, you'll have figured it out. Oh, this is right. So scene one and scene two, camera three, uh, another way that I'll do this, rather than using scene one and scene two, I, I could just use letters. So I would do scene A, camera one, you know, or something along those lines. Um, whatever system really works for you, but I personally prefer to have the camera as the second number. Um, it, it just, that's my brain wraps around it a little easier. If you prefer to put the camera first, by all means, do it that way. Um, Again, it's just I prefer to have it that way so that when I'm organizing it, it's easier to sort by scene. So once we finish here, we've got scene one, camera seven, scene two, camera seven. Um, we've got all of our cameras logged with the appropriate camera number and the appropriate scene number. What we're going to do is we're going to go ahead and take them out in our next clip here. So. Um, Moving on, we're gonna organize these into scenes. So this is the step one of logging, um, and we're gonna move into organizing footage next. Okay, 
So now that we've got our footage logged and all of our camera cards are labeled appropriately, so the each recording is labeled by the scene as well as the camera, it's time to start organizing our footage by scene. Because we're gonna have, when we go to Stitch, we wanna have seven cameras of the same scene to bring into the program. So to make it easy on ourselves, we're gonna create a new folder for scene one. We're also gonna make a folder for scene two so that we can um, just keep everything in the places where it belongs. So first step we're gonna do is we're gonna just go ahead and remove the footage out of the camera folders now that they're appropriately logged and we're going to bring them in there. And by the way, make sure that you go back and you double check those before you, you bring them out just because uh, it can be problematic to try to remember where something goes. So now that we've got all of our camera footage removed from the camera folders, we're gonna go ahead and sort by scene. So I'm gonna grab all of the scene one files and bring them into scene one. I'm gonna repeat that with scene two files, grab them and drop them into scene two. Um, I'm just gonna make a new folder here just to kind of um, not have so many junk folders. I don't like to delete things just in case I, I, had, I made a mistake or something. So I'm just gonna call that folder um, just vault here and uh, that'll just kind of sit at the bottom. So now I've got all of my cameras from scene one and all of my cameras from scene two, one through seven on both of them. And things are looking good. So with that, we're gonna go ahead and start. Next video, we're gonna go ahead and finish our organizing and get ready for Stitch. Okay, so I'm gonna do a little prep work here. Um, so what we're gonna do is we're gonna create two folders here. One is for our 360 raw footage, which is the stuff that came out of the camera. It's not synced up. And then we're gonna create a folder that says 360 sync. These are where we're gonna put the, the footage after we get everything synced together and the tripod removed. So I'm gonna move all of that footage that we had originally and put it into raw. Um, we're also gonna create a folder for our projects. Um, there's gonna be a couple more folders that might show up down the, down the road, but for now we're just gonna have these three, project files, raw, and sync. Um, and just so I keep myself organized, I'm gonna move both raw and sync inside of a footage folder. So um, I get very OCD about that. So, all right, so we're going to footage. We're gonna look out here. We've got all of our scene one files, um, camera one through seven. And uh, what we wanna do with these is now get them ready to sync up. And if you look here on camera two, I've got a tripod sitting right in the middle there. If we're okay to actually have that in the final output, um, no problem, we can just sync these as they are. And here you look at camera six, it's got the same thing. We've got a big tripod sitting down in the middle of the frame um, and camera seven. So, you know, if it, it, it can be a little bit uh, funky having that tripod hanging out in the middle of our 360 thing. It, it, it's much more professional if we can do something to remove that. So we'll get ready to do that in our next episode. Okay, so now that we've got our footage logged, organized, everything is ready to go, um, the next step is removing that unsightly tripod from our shot. So um, there's one step of preparation to do there, and it's actually quite simple. We wanna go and find the shot that has our tripod, so we're camera two here. Um, we also have that tripod in camera six and camera seven but uh, we're gonna create a JPEG out of there. So I'm gonna create a folder to put those JPEGs called clone um, images, I guess would be fine. And uh, then I'm gonna go ahead and open that file into a full screen and make it nice and big. Then I'm gonna go ahead and scan ahead until I can find a spot. My characters are not walking around near the tripod. So right about towards the middle of the frame there, that looks that looks good. I'm gonna take a screenshot. On a Mac computer, it's Command-Shift-3. Um, on a PC, you've gotta go in there and do that whole print screen thing and then save the file. A little more complicated. But uh, now I've got my scene one camera two tripod file. I'm gonna rename that on my desktop. And now I'm gonna go ahead and get the same thing from camera, what was it, six, I think. Yeah, camera six and camera seven. So if I open up camera six, make that full screen, I'm gonna scan ahead to a spot where there isn't anyone standing around the tripod. Now this definitely works a lot easier. I'm gonna go ahead and grab a screenshot there. Um, this definitely works a lot easier if you have a floor 
that is um, that is clean and easily clonable. If you're on a highly detailed thing with a lot of uh, uh, something like a, I don't know, like a, a toilet is underneath you and you need to duplicate that thing, it gets challenging. So you want to sort of find something like sand or grass or just concrete uh, to put your tripod because then you can clone that out very easily. It says here there's not a lot of unique characteristics so if we were to remove that tripod um, it would be pretty simple. So now I've got camera 7 I'm gonna make that a big full screen and take a snapshot. Alright so we've got our screenshot of all three cameras I'm just gonna rename this one. Scene 1 camera 7 tripod. Okay so um, I'm gonna take these three screenshots and I'm gonna bring them into this clone images folder. All right, so now I've got my scene one. I've got all three, uh, all three cameras that have the tripod sitting at the bottom of them. I've taken an image of that and I'm gonna bring that into Photoshop in the next chapter and we are going to take that tripod out of the equation. So before we even get into doing our stitching, I prefer to have that tripod out of the equation right off the bat. Now, some people prefer to do that in the very last step. Um, for me, there is a reason why I like to do it at the beginning, and that is because if I export the video without the tripod, then I'm able to actually save time by not having to worry about synchronizing the footage during um, the AVP process, during the stitching process. I'll just export something without a tripod and synced with all my other cameras, and then I'm good to go. But uh, so we'll get into that in the next lesson. So, all right, let's go. Okay, so now um, we've got our pictures and ready to take the tripod out of these pictures. We're going to be able to use those um, those pictures without a tripod, cut a hole in the image that has a tripod, and we're going to be able to remove the tripod from the video. So first step first is removing the tripod from the still image. So if we go over to each one, we've, I'm just going to open all three of these in Photoshop. Um, we are only going to use this clone stamp tool. That's the only thing that we're going to need. And this does not have to be a perfect render. Um, we're just going to remove the tripod here. So I'm going to option click and find a source. If you haven't used the clone brush tool, it's, um, it's, it's a lifesaver. Um, how it works is it basically copies, if you see the small cursor to the right, it copies whatever's over there and it places it wherever the big cursor is, where I'm clicking. And you can find a new surface if you if you sort of run out of area by by option clicking and then dragging. So you see it'll copy whatever whatever I see. Um, now again, it's this does not have to be a perfect thing. We just want to remove the tripod. Because we're working with something like cement, it's very easy. So we're going to go ahead and export this um, to the folder we had earlier, um, clone images, and I'm going to just call this one clean. All right. So I don't. Need, I'm not going to worry about saving that because we're done. All right. So now I'm going to open up the other image, camera two tripod. I'm going to option click, grab some um, the, the the kind of a source artwork, and I'm going to click and clean. So we are just kind of painting out the tripod using a copy or a clone of other cement. So now, instead of tripod, we have cement. Look at that. Boom. And, you know, again, I'm not worried about this being perfect. I'm basically, this is going to go behind our video. Um, and we're going to cut a hole in our video. So boom. now I'm just going to rename this camera two and clean. Okay. And boom, close this. Don't save. All right. Next up, we are going to do camera seven. All right, so same thing. Option click, grab some source uh, concrete, and start painting out our tripod. Dun, dun, dun. Okay. You know, I the concrete is not quite as fun as some of the other things that we've, environments we've created. I mean, like, kind of doing it with a chair or some a desk can be kind of fun, but... Anyway, concrete it is. Export, quick export as PNG. We're going to call this tripod uh, camera 7 clean. So next thing that we'll do is we'll bring those images into Photoshop. I mean, we'll bring those images into Premiere along with all of our original footage. 
So here you see these are our pictures and there's no tripod. That's how the tripod was before and you know now there's no tripod there. So we're gonna bring all of our original videos in and we're gonna use Premiere to sync all of that footage to the same so it happens at the same time and we're gonna remove the tripod from the videos. Okay, so that's in the next lesson. Okay, so now we're gonna get ready to synchronize our footage and re-export without the tripod. So first thing that we're gonna do is we are going to go ahead and open up Premiere. Um, now if you use a different editing software you should be able to sort of recognize what I'm doing and uh, and recreate this. So we're gonna go ahead and create a new project. We're gonna call this um, we're gonna, first we're gonna put it in our project files folder. So we're gonna call this demo video. So we're gonna put our thing there, we're gonna call it demo video, and boom, let's go. So first thing we're gonna do, we've got an empty project. We're gonna go ahead and bring in our footage. So grab footage, 360 raw. We're gonna we're just gonna worry about scene one for now. Um, so I've got all of my cameras. We're gonna bring all seven of those cameras in. Let me go ahead and switch to the project. There we go. Okay. Uh, we're going to just drag and drop into your project folder. Uh, all of those cameras are going to load up. Do, 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 do. Okay. So now we have all of our seven cameras in the project. First thing we're going to do is we're going to create a new sequence based on the settings of our footage. That's very important. Make sure you don't have a different settings in your footage. Now I'm just going to call this uh, this sequence. So I'm gonna call this scene one sync underscore C and I'm gonna leave that blank because every time I export a camera I'm gonna rename it to whatever camera it will be. Alright so now I'm going to just watch how I, how I kinda put these these next cameras on. So I've got scene one as the base I'm gonna sort of bring C2, camera 2 above and below it so the audio is going below it. What I'm doing is I'm creating kind of like a tower of clips or a sandwich or, or you know something however your mind wraps around this but the idea is we want all of these to be able to um, be layers on top of each other so the sound is linked to each video um, and we want to keep it that way so first thing we're gonna do is we're gonna go ahead and so double check we've got cameras one through seven we're gonna select all and in Premiere, this is very easy. You just right-click, synchronize. And that will read the audio waveforms. And it will go ahead and synchronize. And if you zoom in to see the waveform, you'll see that everything is kind of like in the general vicinity. Um, let's see. Is that, uh, is that synchronized? I mean, that one camera looks a little bit off. But as close up as I am, that might, that might be less than a frame. Let's check it out. So... Yeah, so if I zoom in here and I'm going to just kind of shift that over one frame. Let's see. So that's over one frame. Yeah, no, it looks like it was better off where it was. So um, the the manual, the the automatic sync did a really good job at finding, finding that spot. All right, now what I'm going to do is I'm going to make some room beneath each of the cameras that has a tripod. So if I'm going to go ahead, I know camera two has a tripod on it, so I'm going to go ahead and select all those layers and I'm just gonna I'm just gonna well first I'm gonna unlink so I can I can do them one by one and I'm just gonna nudge that up in Premiere you can use alt and arrow up to nudge that camera two up um, I'm gonna do the same thing for camera six and camera seven so I'm gonna go ahead and now that I've, I've made some space there between each of those um, I'm gonna go ahead and bring in my photos the ones that I did that has the have the clone out of them so if I go back to footage I'm going to go into the raw, grab that clone images folder. I just want the clean ones. I don't want the ones with the tripod. So I'm going to go ahead and import that footage. And um, let's start with camera seven. Oops, I got to. Oh. All right, so I'm going to get camera seven. And you see how it's a JPEG. It's just, or it's a PNG file. It's a flat thing. I'm just going to extend it so it goes as long as the sequence. All right. And then I'm going to put camera six underneath camera six. Extend that, make it nice and long. And last but not least, camera two. I'm gonna grab the photo for camera two, the one that I pulled the tripod out, and I'm just gonna make that nice and big. Okay, cool. So, um, 
one thing that's going to be interesting is now camera 7 is composed of two layers. I'm going to change the color of those two layers so that I recognize that they're grouped together. So I'm just going to do that for my own brain. Um, again, being organized helps you make less mistakes. So understanding that those two layers are one and the same, I'm, it's going to save me that time later. So I've got, I've got all seven cameras now. Even though I've added three layers, three of those layers belong to those other cameras. So now if we kind of uh, scan through, now we're going to have to cut a hole in our camera seven. Because if you see, we've definitely got that tripod there. We definitely want to remove that. So I'm going to scan ahead until there's a spot where... Uh, uh, well, first, let's, let's just get rid of this pre-roll. Okay, so we're going to get rid of all this pre-roll. Um, you know, right after I push record, that's about a good spot to start. And then when I'm coming up to call it a wrap, let's go ahead and cut it there. You want to leave a little bit of space, you know, just so that you have that to fall back on if, if there's some kind of mistakes or something like that. Um, you know, oops. So um, now I've got all of my footage. This is a very important step here to, you've got everything synchronized already, but you want to make sure that you have your heads and tails of all your clips starting and stopping at the, at the exact same time. So I've, I've trimmed the head and I've trimmed the tail of these clips. So all seven of my cameras start and stop at the same time. All right, now it's time to cut that hole in this tripod. So camera seven, you see that there, there's a tripod there. Um, what we're going to do is we select that layer, we're going to go ahead and add the crop effect. Um, if anyone knows a faster way to, to, to do this in Premiere, let me know. Like I, my specialty really is in After Effects, but you know, the Premiere makes it pretty easy too. So we're gonna go ahead and grab a pen tool from the crop effect. So we're gonna apply the crop effect, get in there, put a pen on it. And um, what we're gonna do is we're just gonna create a, uh, whoops, we're gonna create a little mask um, about the same shape of this as this tripod. I'm going to take the shadow out as well. So now we're going to just adjust the size of this, uh, just adjust the size of that mask. And we're going to, okay. So first thing we're going to do, so we've got that mask on. Now we need to apply the crop effect. Right now it's not doing anything because all of our crops is at zero. So we're going to extend one of those to 100. So you see here how um, it, it it's kept what's inside of the mask. So I need to um, not check the inverted box. So now you see there's a big hole chopped in that image. The tripod is gone. Um, I'm just going to feather that about 40 pixels or so. And now see how the, the image beneath it, that, that cloned image we took, is smaller than the, the other one. So we're going to just make that a little bigger. Um, and that looks good. So the tripod is gone. There's, it, it's a little bit, uh, you know, there's, it's not perfect, but I think when it's all stitched together, it should be just dandy. So now we're going to go ahead and repeat that process with camera six. I'm going to hide the camera seven layers. Um, see, if I hide camera six, you'll see our image there. Just so I don't have to do that later, I'm going to make camera six tripod image, or the cloned image, the same size. All right, so now I'm gonna react, re make camera six visible. I'm gonna go apply the crop effect on camera six, and I'm gonna go ahead and draw a mask using the pen tool in the crop effect, and we are going to make a nice little mask. So, once you kind of get that mask around the, um, the tripod, on your crop, you're gonna go ahead and change one of your values on the crop to 100%. Um, it's good to just kind of feather that out. You know, you're gonna need it about 40 pixels or so. Okay, and we're gonna go ahead and change the crop to 100%. Boom, doesn't that look great? So we've got the image underneath showing where the hole is instead of the tripod. So we're gonna go ahead and move to our next cameras. You know, I'm toggling through until I get to camera two. So I'm, I'm, um, hiding those layers so we can see camera two. Now if I hide camera two uh, main layer, the video layer, the photo layer pops up. I'm going to make that the same size as the um, 
sequence. Okay, so to going back to our video layer, we're going to apply the crop effect, and just like we did with the others, we're going to draw a nice little circle where our tripod is, and we're going to um, do, 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 just set it nice and boom. We've got our tripod surrounded by a circle. We're going to feather the mask about 40 pixels, and we're going to crop the entire thing. So now we have a hole in camera two as well, and the image of the cloned tripod shows up at the bottom. So now we're going to go ahead and hide all of the videos except for camera one. So if you see that, I've, I've go ahead, I've went ahead and I've I've hidden all cameras up until camera one. So now it's only camera one showing. And I'm gonna go ahead and hit export media. Um, here's where it gets really tricky. If you just do high bit rate on the export, you're gonna have, yeah, it's gonna be the same settings as what you recorded, but if you look at your bit rate, your target bit rate is gonna be about 10, um, 10,000 pixels or 10,000 kilobytes. Uh, 10 megabytes per second. That is gonna give you a really chunky video. So let's bring that up to about 50. 50 megabytes per second as your target bit rate. That should be about the same um, bit rate as our original video. I'm also gonna check this render at maximum depth. We don't wanna lose any of the information that we've shot with our GoPros. We wanna keep this as close to the original as possible. Now, when you do render this in, when you do sync the, stitch all of this together, you can export up to 8K. Um, we're gonna keep it in 4K, but you still don't wanna, you don't wanna start introducing artifacts or pixels at this stage. You wanna save that for their final export. So we're gonna keep these nice and big. So I'm gonna go ahead and create a folder inside of 360 sync um, for scene one. And I'm gonna go ahead and label this as camera one. Um, so I'm gonna go ahead and cue that out. Boom. And I'm now I'm going to activate camera two. So if you see, if I hide that layer there, that's what would show up if I hide the picture. So now I'm going to go ahead and hit export media. Um, see, I've saved it. I've saved that as a preset or I should have saved it as a preset, but boom. So I have the same thing here, 50, 50, um, and maximum depth. So we're H264 maximum depth, boom. All right, so we're at H264, and we're gonna call this camera two. We're gonna send that to the same folder we just made. So keep in mind, just a quick recap on that. You wanna have a separate folder for your sync footage. That's why we made that at the earlier in the tutorial. If you missed that, you just wanna have a separate folder for your synchronized footage than your um, regular footage, your raw footage, like straight from the camera. Because all of this footage, we've taken an extra time to trim the heads and tails so that they all start at the exact same time. Um, I'm gonna do the same thing for camera three now. So export that, we're gonna keep the same settings, double check, 50, 50 on our bit rate, cool. Okay, um, boom, so now I've got cameras one, two, and three loaded. Now let's, let's go back to Premiere, let's activate camera four. Boom, now we see camera four, file, export media. And um, this does get pretty, you get, you get the hang of this pretty quick. So boom, camera four and shoot that over to the renderer. All right, back to here. Now we're gonna get camera five, do the same thing. You remember when we get to camera six and seven, we need both layers activated, so. All right, so now we've got camera five, file, export media. Cool. And export, all right, back to Premiere. So here we go. So. Camera six, so that's two layers. Export media and rename to camera six. You see why I left that that last number off of there because I knew I'm gonna have to type it seven times, so I left it blank. All right, and now we're gonna go to camera seven. So you see, if I only did one of those layers, that's what would happen. But we want both layers, so let's go to file, export media, and camera seven. Okay. So I've got all seven cameras ready to go. I'm gonna go ahead and hit start rendering. And um, that's not gonna to take too long because this is a shorter video. If, if, this were, if this were like a 13 minute sequence, this would 
take a long time, but fortunately this is like a 30 second clip. So we're only over 16 second um, demo. So we're looking at like a nice minute long for this. To get your head wrapped around it, it's a much better thing to record some short videos instead of recording these like gigantic files. Get your head wrapped around how the process works with some small file size uh, videos. You know, if you try to record a 16 minute demo to practice on, it's, it's just gonna be a lot of processing, a lot of rendering and stuff. So get your skills up with, with shorter, smaller file sizes and then work your way up after that. So boom, um, that looks great. So we're gonna go ahead and continue on the to the next lesson where we're actually gonna take our synchronized videos and we're gonna start stitching them together. Awesome. All right, so now let's go ahead and do what we've all been waiting for. Stitching our videos together, yay! Okay, so we're gonna go ahead and open our program, Auto Pano Video Pro 2.3 AVP. So now we open that project up and it has this big gray thing that says import videos to get started. So we're gonna go ahead and do that. We're gonna go find our synchronized video. So this, see, this is where everything came after it exported. Um, we've got cameras seven through one, or one through seven from scene one, and they're all synchronized. Theoretically, if you didn't do it that way, don't worry. You can you can use this program. If you didn't want to remove the tripod, you didn't want to sync everything in Premiere. You can sync inside of AVP. I just don't find it as reliable. Sometimes it doesn't quite work, and it's harder to make it work. So in Premiere, you can kind of move things around, and and, and it's easy. So I like to do that that extra step in Premiere just so I'm guaranteed um, my things are going to be synchronized correctly. So now let's, you know, we've got all of our seven cameras in here and you can see like, you know, that's where that, that's what it looks like when you cut a hole on that camera seven there. So we've got the hole cut where the tripod was. So um, before we stitch, I'm just gonna go move the playhead up to a spot in the middle of the thing. And um, this is kind of the order that you would go in, synchronize, stitch, stabilize, color. We're gonna go to stitch and then we're gonna hit this button that says stitch. Um, also, it just, you see it, how it has a GoPro is your setting right there, GoPro 3 or 4. Okay, there we go. So now you see we've got this awesome looking world that's all like wavy and stuff. And uh, you can see the whole parking lot and the interns and me. And if you just kind of grab that thing, you can move it to the way you want. It's, it's pretty intuitive. Just kind of pick it up and drag it. You can spin it left and right. Um, and it uh, looks like everything's stitched together very nicely. We're gonna go ahead and hit apply to save that change that I just did to the, uh, to the world. Um, yeah, I mean, that looks, that looks fairly decent. We, we can scan through the clip and see if it's, okay, no, if you don't hit apply, it'll revert those things back. So if you wanna save your changes, hit apply. If you don't, it'll kinda like shoot them out. So um, yeah, this looks, this looks great. So we're gonna go ahead and kind of, if you put the, grid on with that grid button you can see uh, kind of make your horizon actually flat if you don't have a flat horizon it gets really trippy if you kind of put that on in in your in like a VR headset and you're not level it can really leave you feeling unsettled so that's about it for stitching so we're gonna have um, just gonna kind of look through and see if we've got any problem areas that we're gonna have to correct or anything but I mean for the most part looks pretty good I'm gonna go ahead and save it and uh, next, next, uh, next chapter, we're gonna go ahead and go through the. Uh, I'm gonna put it in project files. I'm just gonna call it uh, Stitch. So what we're gonna do after this is we're gonna go ahead and, and scan through and find any problem areas with the Stitch and try to correct those in APG. I'm gonna just show you some basic tools um, for that. It gets really intense if you really want to get in there and be very precise, but. For this, for our purposes, we're gonna get a nice general um, general flow. All right, so, you know, doing the stitch, it's not always gonna be perfect. You're gonna have some some issues here um, where the where your actors kind of cross through the, the parallax of the of the lenses. Um, so we gonna we're gonna try to do our best to clean it up to make it so that when uh, people walk through the seams of of the cameras, they don't disappear they don't have missing heads or three bodies so if you see here oh yep there she goes so our intern has just kind of uh disappeared so 
we're going to need to um, fix that. You're kind of looking at some other spots here. For the most part, it looks like uh, the, the left side of our panorama is pretty good. It's just a couple spots over there where, where our poor little intern gets gets um, caught between the lenses. So, yeah, it looks like, you know, the, 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 the big problem area is really right in here. So, what we're going to do is we're going to go ahead and, and go to the spot where it's bad. Let's say right here, it looks pretty bad. And we're going to hit this edit button. You could also double click the blue playhead, but uh, it, you, you might shift the position. So I just like to use that edit button. Boom, you push that and it opens the project, the panorama. It sends that information to APG, Auto Panel Giga. And we're gonna, you, you see we have a new project there, um, c0.panel, so it creates a .panel file. We are going to go to the edit button of that and if you're doing multiple things, you, you'll have multiple panoramas there. So up at the top, there's a whole bunch of crazy looking tools and gadgets up there. We are only concerned with two of them. This little target looking thing, these are your markers to um, sort of say what lens is your preferred lens. And if you activate this little green button, it's very important. See that little green button on the bottom left corner? This will show you... Um, sort of where each seam lands. So as you can tell, our poor intern is caught between three lenses here. But you know, and you can see as you as you pass between each one, there's a different level of parallax going on on each one. So, you know, our program is having a hard time trying to decide where. So what's happening is it's 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 saying let's stitch it at those palm trees back there. So let's make the palm trees good. Unfortunately, because the palm trees are good, poor intern is chopped up. So we're going to change that. We're going to go ahead and hit this move tool and we're going to grab there's you can either do it with the full panorama. You can either grab the full panorama and move um, the panorama around or you can select the picture only and isolate what happens on each one of those pictures. So we're going to do use that tool. We're going to select the move picture. We're going to go click on camera one and we're going to move it around until it, uh, it feels it's about right. And you can zoom in, because obviously it's uh, pretty small, so you see a little bit better. And we're going to grab camera one, and we're going to try to line it up. You can kind of, the opacity changes, you can see now. Um, and you just kind of play with the position, the rotation, the scale of that um, with, those, with this tool, until you get something that feels about right. Um, if you hit this blend button, it will go ahead and um, show you what it would look like if it's all blended together. Um, you can also change to smart cutting. This is this is probably recommended on a scene like this where the bulk of the things are are pretty much standard. Um, we're gonna hit OK. So with smart cutting, it it really does a much better job at sort of finding um, similarities between pixels. For our purposes, it's a static camera. Smart cutting is going to be great. If you're moving the camera, smart cutting is just not going to work. Now, I'm going to play with this a little bit, see if I can find something better. So I'm just going to go to camera one. I'm going to, I'm going to just kind of move it around, um, go back to the, the blend mode to see if I, I get something that looks better. Um, I'm going to try to not move any of the other cameras. I'm just going to move that one camera one there and hit blend, see what that looks like. I mean, that looks great. So I'm going to go ahead and save this. And when I hit save, you'll see this little blue uh, pinwheel happen. If you go back to APG, you see the same little processing pinwheel there. So that means that things are working. All right, so it's it's sent. When I hit save in APG, it sends it right into the uh, AVP. Boom, and now I'm going to hit blend. So you see if when it comes into AVP and you hit smart blend, you can't activate, you can't play with the horizon, the stitch, or the mask layers. I'm not going to get into that on this on this tutorial, um, but uh, you know, when you have a more complicated scene that has a lot of different people moving throughout the scene, you'll need to change what happens to the stitch. And that is how you would use these state changes. If you cut the, if you cut the actual scene down on the bottom, 
you can you can create different states in the stitch but for our purposes this is a short scene very simple we only have one state so that's it for this one we're going to go ahead and um, you know once again we're going to save this and close it oh you see now actually as i'm playing through you want to check to make sure that uh, everything looks good i noticed another spot here so she's not quite perfect there so i'm going to kind of play with it and here I can actually instead of changing the size of it I can leave the size the same because if you see she she sort of shows up on the seam there I'm gonna change the um, I'm gonna use the markers to say that I'm gonna use this lens only so we're moving our our seam line so we're moving the seam line so that our our intern will stay in the bottom camera um, and uh, boom, once we get that, we're gonna hit save. And you see the line has moved, so now that it compensates for her head. So now she's only on one lens. Boom, she's not getting cut in half anymore. And we hit save, and that's gonna send it back to AVP. And utilizing the markers, you can sort of strategically place where that seam happens so that you're not sitting there at the, at the end of it like, man, this guy's walking right on the seam, but you can always move the scene so, to a spot where he's not walking. So cool. I think um, that, again, that was a pretty intense one. Um, for the most part, play around with those tools, figure it out. If you, if you don't get the hang of it and you still need more info on that, go to the auto panel site and you can really find some good uh, information about how to stitch and how to get some really precise results with the masking tool. Okay, so now we are going to go ahead and do our next step, which is blending our lenses together with the Auto Color Correct tool. And this is actually way easier than you think. You just go over here to, um, well, color. And we're going to go ahead and scroll down until we see a button that says Compute Automatic Color Correction. So, Compute Automatic Color Correction that just takes a few moments and then it will go ahead and finish okay so it looks like our color is done if you bring this up we can see that on the color thing now I've got something that says it's been um, taken care of so I'm gonna go ahead and save the project and next lesson we're gonna go ahead and render out our panorama okay so now we've got our it's all stitched together the color is blended it's looking sharp now it's time to render this baby out. We're gonna pick where we wanna have our center point. So we're gonna move our horizon until we get the sweet spot. I'm gonna say, hmm, you know, right around in there or so. Yeah, it looks like, that looks pretty good. We'll have that be our center point and we're gonna go ahead and hit apply. It looks pretty level too. I think that's good enough. Um, cool, so then once we're happy with our horizon, we're looking where we wanna go, we're gonna hit render. Um, several options here. I'm going to change this to 4K and you want to make sure that it's, it's 2 to 1 aspect ratio. So the real output 4096 by 2048. We could do a Cineform file and you see how big this can get? Almost 8K. 8000 resolution. Um, you know, and you can change it to like medium or high profile. Obviously you probably want to be in high if you're in Cineform. Um, it's going to take a long time to render that. But we're going to go ahead and do this 4K MP4. We're going to change the settings so it's original video on the frames per second and then we're going to change the bit rate this part is actually very important on our bit rate we want to make that nice and high again this is the same thing we're going to be introducing artifacts we're going to introduce low quality pixelation if we don't have our bit rate nice and high having it at 25,000 24,000 is going to be pretty low let's jump that up to 80,000 bitrate that should give us a nice high quality image so okay then we're going to change where we're going to save it to we're just going to create a new folder stitched renders and we're going to rename the file scene one stitch okay so that looks pretty good we're just going to hit render and boom it sends it to the render queue you can now do many of these at the same time so that's great you can kind of get one set up, load up another project, hit render, and then go home, come back the next day, and everything should be done. 
Um, I actually have very few problems with this program crashing. It does a really good job. Uh, this last update has been pretty stable. So if you have this 2.3.3 uh, version, it's been it's been pretty stable for me. So um, yeah, and you just go ahead and, and it'll process that and it'll run through and render everything. All right, so now we are uh, ready to go with our final few steps. We've got our video rendered out, our 360 video rendered out. We're going to go ahead and bring it into Premiere and just do a, a nice little color correct on it um, and get it ready to export. So first step we're going to do is obviously grab our footage that we're going to render out. So we're going to go ahead and go into the... Um, mm -mm -mm. We're going to go ahead and grab the thing that's been rendered out successfully. So if we go to demo footage, stitched renders, boom, there it is. And we're gonna bring it into our Premiere project. Okay, so remember when we set the camera settings long time ago, we had our camera set at flat so that we could have more control to kind of adjust the color later. So if you really look at this, um, it's pretty, uh, so it, if you look at the colors, they're actually very um, washed out almost. It's just very desaturated, very flat. And that's a good thing for us to grade because we now have a lot of room to do whatever we want with it, right? Okay, now what we're going to do is we're going to trim the head and tail of this because we don't need all that pre-roll. And boom. Cool. So now our scene is about 16 seconds long. And I'm just going to bring it down so I can see it. So... Yeah, if you look at this color, it, it's a little it's a little flat. We can definitely and you can zoom in on your on your thing here by you know selecting that. So if you zoom in and you get the feeling that you're in that kind of like 360 view. So we're gonna go ahead and uh let's go back to let's find a good frame that we can color correct. That looks fine, I guess. Um and we're gonna go ahead and um start playing with the color. So if I select that, I'm going to go into the effects, select the video, go into the effects, color correction, and I'm just going to use this Lumetri color. It's got all the stuff that you need to really make it, um, to do to do some good basic corrections without having too many different tools. So I'm going to use Lumetri color, just go on the basic corrections, and the first thing I'm going to do is just kind of pump up my saturation. So go into saturation, one, see if we go to 170, whoa, yeah, I guess we can go up to 160-ish. Um, yeah, there's a little bit, there's a little bit of hot spots in the greens there, which we'll, we'll sort of take out a little bit later, but I'm play with the shadows, play with, um, you know, cutting out some of the blacks there and adding some contrast. Give it a good sort of uh, vibrant pop. And so we're just gonna put a little contrast in there, take out some of the shadows. That's looking pretty good. Um, maybe we'll cool it off just a couple, just a couple notches there. And um, yeah, looking around at some of the other spots on the scene, that seems to be pretty cool. Uh, I'm 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 digging that. So yeah, that looks good. And there's our little camera, camera intern on the other side there. Um, Okay, so next thing that we're going to do, I'm just going to kind of play with a couple other things on the color. If I open up Creative, I can kind of get in there and mess with the, the saturation on those individual channels. So um, I want to sort of, well, just boost the vibrance up a little bit and, uh, you know, kind of get it to something that you feel looks good. I like that blue sky. It's, it's just very, you know, very nice. And again, if you're not so familiar with, with this, just think of it as Instagram, honestly. It's just, you know, color, the, the same sort of words that they use in Instagram, they're going to use in here. So if you kind of play with Instagram and get a feel for what each thing does, but we're going to isolate our greens in that saturation because that, that bush in the back is very hot. So we're going to sort of, on the saturation channel, so we're going to sort of kind of bring down the saturation of that specific section until it's something... A little less, uh, mm, yeah, just, just kind of, boom, right around in there. So there we go. So we've got the, the same saturation, kind of the, the nice reds a pop, uh, the blues are looking good, but those yellow, the, those yellows and greens are not as, um, as uh, hot. Cool. So that looks good on the saturation. Um, 
and all the color info. If I make that a little bigger, I can get in there and see just kind of what the scene looks like. Um, just to double check. So that's looking pretty good. Um, you know, much better than the flat. You know, and now I'm looking at it. There's a couple, you know, there's a couple seams that didn't sort of come out that perfect. But, you know, for our purposes, I think we did pretty good. You know, there's nobody that's just kind of, um, you know, we, we understand what's happening in the scene. It's not too crazy. Um, I'm just going to kind of get in there and just drop the vibrance a little bit. See if that does anything. And that feels a little more just natural. So I like that. Cool. And we're going to go ahead and just save that. And uh, we'll get ready to drop in a little music file and export that in our final lesson. All right. So this is our final lesson. We are going to export our footage from Premiere. And um, good. So we're going to go get started. I'm just going to grab a little music file. And I'm going to bring that into our project. Um, just a cool little hip hop thing here. And we're going to boom, drop that. And I'm just going to kind of uh, adjust the, the levels here on that. Um, I'm going to just normalize peaks to zero. And uh, boom, scan through that a little bit. As I, as I play through this music, I'm seeing... I'm, as I play through this music, I'm seeing it, it it's kind of peaking quite a bit. So I'm actually going to drop the... Uh, the gain by five. So there we go. Normalize max peaks to negative five. That way I'm, I'm sort of peaking right around there. Cool. So now I've got a little music track laid in and um, you know, I'm just going to go ahead and render that out. So file export media. Okay. So here's the last little step. This is, this is the tricky part. So our video has been colored. It's ready to go. We're going to use an H264 just to kind of keep it, keep it, uh, um, small and we're going to make a new folder in our project called uh, exports cool so this is scene one v360 cool okay so now i'm going to change that to so we're at uh h264 match source the thing i want to change is baseline especially if you're going to be playing this in a vr headset on a phone or you're going to be streaming it or something Baseline lets it lets it render much better for cellular. So, um, bit rates and stuff. I'm just gonna leave them the same here. Like it's it's a low bit rate, especially for a 4K video. It'll play at a 1080 in the in the headsets, but I, I prefer to just have it at 4K with a low bit rate. So this is good. It's only gonna be a 20 megabyte file. If you upload that or to YouTube and stuff, it's gonna be different. Um, there's also this option VR video. So we're gonna check this box, video is VR. This is new in Premiere, um, but yeah, it basically gives it that decoding. And we're gonna select monoscopic. So it has the metadata written into it. We're gonna render it out, send it to the encoder, and um, we're just gonna go ahead and hit render. So what is gonna happen now is we're gonna have our VR video and we can play it wherever we want and it's gonna be great. And then we can show all our friends Look, I know how to make 360 video. And you can go out and you can um, start selling your services as a 360 video expert. So, boom. That's ready to go. We're going to hit play. And that's going to render out. And we're going to be good to go. Cool, guys. Well, thank you so much um, for tuning in to the how to film a 360 how to film and edit and stitch and all that stuff 360 with GoPros and AVP. It has been an awesome run. I am so excited to to stay in the loop with you and to hopefully get some more of these uh, cranked out. So if there's something that you want to learn, let me know. Um, this is what I do. So looking forward to catching you on the flip side.